Hello, and welcome to our Art and Architecture webinar series. I'm Todd Pattison, the conservator here at American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator and virtual MC for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We are the oldest and largest genealogical society in the world. We specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family houses. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the globe. If you miss any of today's presentation, you'll be able to watch the recording on our website and YouTube channel. Today's program is on starting and building a rare book collection. You'll also hear stories about the hunt for rare books, along with how a rare book dealer determines value. After the presentation, there will be a time for a Q&A session. So at any point during the program, you can type your questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. Our guest today is Kenneth Gloss, a rare book specialist, appraiser, and second generation owner of Boston's historic Brattle Bookshop. The bookshop is the recipient of several Best of Boston awards in the categories of Best Bookshop or Best Antiquarian Bookshop, and has been listed as one of North America's best bookstores. Working in the bookshop since childhood, Kenneth chose to go into the book business rather than pursue a doctorate in chemistry. Ken has appeared frequently on national and local radio and TV programs including the Antiques Roadshow. He has written several articles for antique journals and consumer publications and is host of the podcast, Brattlecast, a first-hand look at secondhand books. Please join me in welcoming Ken Gloss. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for uh, joining in on this. It, it's whether you do it webinar, live, I hope we can get back to live uh, soon. Uh, but what I like to do in a talk is the first half hour or so, I'll give some of my background, the history of the store. I'll tell some anecdotes and stories of people, places, things that I've seen. Give, a, give also a little bit of insight into the background and workings of the Antiques Roadshow from an appraiser's point of view. And, and just try to tell stories and show the great interest there is in books and book collecting. Uh, and then we'll go to your question and answers. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of them. Anyone who doesn't get through in this can always contact later. But let me first give some background. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s. But for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married. My mother had $500. And with that, they bought half interest in the Bridal Book Shop. And it's always been in Boston. We get calls, people are in Harvard Square. Where are you? We tell them we're downtown. When my parents first bought the store, there was a little side street on what was Scully Square called Brattle Street. To make it even more confusing, the street doesn't exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is. We've had seven different locations over the years, mainly due to urban renewal. And uh, my father built the store in his great love of books, his hard working, and he was also a bit of a character and a showman. And every time he'd move, when it was a planned move, he would move the best books over to the new location, then run sales, half price dollar, 50 cent quarter dime. Last day of the sale though, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, bags, satchels, whatever, ring a big bell, they'd go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again, that group would leave, the next group would come in, and he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969, and we were moving from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall to West Street, where we are now. And at the end of the giveaway, there were books left over. And like I said, my father was a bit of a character and a showman. And if you can sort of picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy horse team. And on the cover of the covered wagon, it said, go West book lovers, go five West Street Brattle Bookshop. 
they filled it up with books and they drove it from Boston City Hall up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is, and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend of his, told him he could do it all morning. But within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. They told him to stop. He didn't care, he'd gone in his point of class. And we've been on West Street since then. We first moved in in a five-story, 150-year-old uh, wooden building, the absolutely crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at four o'clock in the morning, the building was on fire and it literally burned to the ground. I mean, 100% gone. And, but the main thing was we wanted to continue, not go out of business to keep going. We found a location a few doors up the street. We rented folding tables, people either sold, gave us, donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time came down with a carload of books. And even though it was a meager stock, the main thing was just keep going. Over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the store. Uh, four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is just to the next to the, where the building burnt down. And it's sort of the old style antiquarian bookshop. Uh, and it was the old style. And it's sort of that type of business is a dying business. And it's not dying because people don't like books, buy books, sell books, read books, but because in the inner cities in particular, property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other has been going out of business. Now, like I say, we bought our business in the early 80s, so I hope to do this for years to come. And if, from what you can see in the picture, uh, yeah, that's, that's a picture of me in the store. But what you could see in the picture with the outside lot, which people love, is that outside lot is where the building burnt down. And the building we have now is steel and concrete. It has all sorts of sprinklers, alarms, and whatever. And 40 years later or 50 years later, I can look back at it and jokingly say, and we know we can burn a building down next to it and it won't burn because we've done it. Uh, in any case, and then I've done this all my life. My parents say my first word was book. I don't know, maybe it was, I'm sure they were talking about books all the time. And then I worked after school in elementary school. That's a picture of my father and I in the basement of one of the stores. I worked after school in uh, junior high school, high school, summers during college. Again, I do have a degree in chemistry, but in 1973, my father's health wasn't that good. I needed a year off before graduate school. That year now is almost 50 years. And I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this in not in a laboratory somewhere. One of the most interesting parts about the business for me it's going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island, every day, never knowing who you're gonna meet, what you're gonna see, the people, the places and things. And I'll relate a few of those stories to you uh, and then tell a few more. And also sometimes it can be the people who work for us that are characters. Um, we had, Years ago, we had an employee, he had been working a day or two at the store. Uh, a man came in and this it was an older man. He asked for an obscure author named Donifred Yates, a novelist. I knew who Donifred Yates was. I went to the section, we looked, we didn't have any. I said, do you wanna leave your name? He said, no, he left. And my new employee comes up to me after that and says, does that man come in here often? And I said, you know, I wasn't paying that much attention, uh, but no, I didn't. He says, well, that was J.D. Salinger. I used to date his daughter. You never know who's gonna come in or your employees. But as far as the hunt and the search, I was out of the store and I got back and there was a message that a Mrs. Fisher had called and she had some books. I got back, I called her up and she said, oh yes, my father died in Providence. He has 500 art reference books. We wanna get the best price we can. We're inviting a number of deals down to a bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, Providence isn't that far. They lived on Benefit Street, an old street up near Brown University. 
I got to the house, a large old colonial house, got led through the house into a courtyard, into a garage. Second floor of the garage, there were 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after eight months, I bought 90% of the books I wanted. I was pleased, she was happy. And she said, my mother has a lot of books. Would you be interested in going down to Newport to take a look at the books there? Well, their house in Newport was one of the mansions on the ocean. I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this slide. And being in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family, and at one point wandering from the basement to the attic, all on my own, without a tour guide saying, come here, go here, do this. It, it was fascinating just in itself. Another time I got called to Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I do programs like this or all day long, people are calling up and asking about values. Almost all of it, we give out free information verbally. Um, you know, what we want is that whenever you think of an old book, you think of us in the bridal bookshop, think of 10 others, but just we be one of the 10. And we feel we can do that as by giving out free information as much as reasonable. Sometimes people need formal appraisals for insurance state, and then we discuss a fee. Any case, another mansion in Newport, not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family, Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. <clears throat> and what they had was a whole stack of papers from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side but it was the day-to-day -day accountings of the ships. They sometimes realized tens of thousands of dollars profit in capturing the ship. In 1812, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one day, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page and it said, Captain, $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last you heard of the captain. When my father was still alive and he died over 35 years ago, we got a call from a lady. She was very vague about her name, who she was, what she had, but she was close by. So it, we decided to go out to her house. We got to the house. It was a little ranch house. Paint was peeling, weeds were growing and you're outside. You say, oh gee, what's there? Walk into the house, she was elderly. There were just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. She got to talking. She was originally from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe, all the court intrigues, all the goings on. Uh, and uh, her stories were absolutely wonderful. The, bo the books were terrible, but you never know what you're gonna see. And when we first got in there, on her wall, she had 10 watercolors. They were pastoral European scenes. When I first saw them, I thought they were nice. The more she talked and the longer we were there and the more I looked at them, the nicer I thought they were. And I finally said to her, those watercolors, they're, they're really nice. And she turned around just very matter of factly said, oh, they're all Turners. So she had probably a million dollars worth of painting. And it's like, oh yeah, they're all turned very matter of factly. And so you never know the characters you're gonna see. And matter of fact, speaking of characters, a number of years ago, we went to one of our customers, 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party and he just, he says to you, I just got back from Barcelona. He gave a lecture and then he's giving a lecture in Florida. And then he said, he's been asked to lecture in Tokyo. And I finally said to him, you're a hundred years old. Don't you think Tokyo is a long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, it took me over 25 hours to get to Chicago. He says, I don't think Tokyo is a whole lot further than that nowadays. And here's a man who can tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And he was obviously a younger man. He said he was very excited about this uh, dinner and all the learning and insight he was going to get from these two men. He said, he got to the table a little early. 
About five minutes later, Ford came in and sat next to him. And about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now Edison was elderly, had one of those big horns for hearing, sat down opposite, and he said the first thing Ford turned to Edison and yelled, my Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, it's the Carter's little liver pills. This man said all night long, all they did was yell about Carter's little liver pills. And he said next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. Now I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more uh, and then uh, get into a few other things. Uh, we get hundreds of phone calls at the store, people wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist? Or what's the value? How much is it worth? And most of those questions, either I or the people I work with, we can answer off the top of our heads. Some are a little more involved and occasionally you really have to do some research, but that's fun too. But every once in a while you get a call that really stands out. Again, uh, I answer the phone, lady, elderly, thick Irish brogue. And the first thing she, I say, hello, Brattle Bookshop, can I help you? First thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. Now you have to admit that gets your attention. She stopped and waited. And then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. And when he was two and three years old, he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her, but maybe not what you first think. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. Now, presidential letters of any type have value. Handwritten letters from a later 20th century president are particularly rare and valuable. She wanted to get an offer. I was actually skeptical about that. But uh, I thought she'd be a lot of fun to meet. I went to her house. She had great stories. The letters were fabulous. I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer, much as I suspected, though. There was no way she could sell these letters. The letters were part of her life. I left a note behind. As far as I know, her family still has them, probably where they belong. But you never know what you're going to see. And and the types of things you're gonna get into. And uh, a lot of times uh, people will ask, what do you see and what do you collect? And I actually don't collect that much. I read a lot of books, I read about books, I read about book collecting, I read Stephen King and John Grisham and people like that on planes and at the beach. Uh, but I get the books after I read them, I bring them back into the store, I sell them. Uh, but uh, when I was growing up, my father used to bring home four, five, six books a day. Do that for 30, 40 years. You can imagine what a house looks like. And a couple of things though that I do collect, uh, and uh, I think they have a picture, but I collect stories. I have page after page after page of either one word, one sentence, uh, one phrase, and it's a story. And so I have loads of those. And matter of fact, I could probably do a lecture by putting these pages on a wall, throwing a dot at it and picking it up. Now, some of them are more interesting than the others. Uh, I was just reading today in the newspaper that there's gonna be a Jack Kerouac Museum. I went into a house once in Drakeit totally unprepared. I mean, no one told me what they had. They had a few good books. Look at the kitchen table. Kitchen table, there's a big roll of paper. It was the manuscript for On the Road. I got to pick it up. I got to touch it. I got to unroll it a few feet. He did a stream of consciousness. So he had it rolls of paper so he didn't have to take the paper out. Got to touch it six feet. It was too fragile. After that, they actually sold it for over $2 million, but I got to touch it. Another one I'm here looking here, the story is storage unit, Ruskin. Well, uh, this was a customer of ours, a friend, and he wanted to sell me some books. And when people call to sell books, we make appointments, we go out, we travel all over New England, the Northeast, uh, a lot of them in the area and all over the country actually. But uh, he called and then he postponed then he called again and he postponed and they called again and he postponed. And the frustrating part about that is more, I could have been doing other things. And after five times, I finally said, Russ, 
call and postpone again your friend, but we're just not going out. The next time comes up, he calls that morning and he says, can't make it. Uh, you just can't come. It was in a storage unit in the Cambridge Somerville border. And he said, you can't come here. I have to postpone. And, and I, you know, and I said, Ross, and he said, no, no, there's a good reason. And he, it turns out there was a sort of a very sad story. There was a lady, uh, she had an abusive husband years and years ago. He ran out on her, ran out on the family, left them. He was alcoholic, abusive, violent. Um, in any case, um, she had a storage unit next to her. And it was a nice storage unit, it had electricity and everything. Uh, and the lady had, was dying. And a, a few days before she actually died, her daughter was there. And she said to her daughter, I have a storage unit. In that storage unit is a freezer. You'll find your father in the freezer. Turned out she had killed him. Nobody missed him because he was gone, but there was a body in the storage unit next to our friend. I said, Russ, that's an excuse I can accept. That night it was on the news. So you never know what you're gonna get or what people are gonna be interested in. You know, you get people interested in really rare and valuable books, collector's items. You never know. But we one time got a, a large collection of cookbooks in, probably a couple of thousand cookbooks. Great collection. But there was a whole box full of these little pamphlets and brochures, how to make jello, how to bake a chocolate company. You know, those little pamphlets that come with the refrigerator and so on. And some of them are nice, but I said to one of my assistants, just put them all outside on our dollar tables. There are bargains in there, but we don't have time. We have 2000 great books to deal with. He put them out and a, about two or three hours later, a man comes running in with one of them and says, I've been looking for this for years and years and years. And it's outside and it's on your dollar table and I found it and he was absolutely beside himself. I look at the pamphlet and the title is Coconuts and Constipation. You never know what someone's gonna look for and what they want. Uh, one of the things that I hope some of you who are listening today watch the Antiques Roadshow, I love doing it. I've been an appraiser there for 20 years. Uh, up until COVID, uh, they used to do the shows at large venues have thousands of people come, two or 3,000 people would come to a show, uh, each with two items. So there's like five, seven, 8,000 items, maybe a hundred or so get taped for TV, which makes up three hours of TV. And the way an appraiser does this, we don't pay, first of all, we don't get paid anything. We pay our own hotels, we pay our own airfares, we pay everything, but it's public television. And you're sitting at a table with a couple of other book appraisers next to the print appraisers, next to the poster, next to jewelry, and people bring in all day long items. And you appraise usually from about 7.30 in the morning, sometimes till six, seven at night. And, and a, from an appraiser's point of view, we're not guaranteed to get on TV. In other words, we paid, we wanna, we wanna be on TV. And the ideal thing for an appraiser on that show is around eight o'clock in the morning, someone comes in with something really interesting and good. You call a producer over, the producer says, that's great. It has a great story. The person doesn't know everything about it. You can add things in, go on TV, you tape. And by nine o'clock in the morning, it makes the rest of the day go very easily because you've already taped something. Whereas if it's four or five in the afternoon and you haven't taped, you get nervous, you might not get on. In any case, this was a city, uh, and this didn't, this was uh, in Kansas City. Man comes in, has a few things from Pope John Paul, a few signed things, they were nice, but nothing that terrific. And then he pulls out a photograph, it, in a group of photographs, it turns out he was the pilot that flew the Pope and his entourage around the country when the Pope came. and there was this one fabulous photo and he had all sorts of stories about the behind the scenes and what they were doing. But normally when you see the Pope, uh, you see him very formally standing there in his vestments, 
people come up to him, kneel down, kiss the ring. It's a very formal situation. This man pulls out a photo. He's the pilot. He's sitting in the pilot seat in his uniform. The Pope is standing behind him over his shoulder in full vestments with one leg up in the air, reaching over, signing his Bible. And I'm going, this is great. It's fabulous. What a story. And I, I went to the man. I said, show me the Bible. He goes, oh, I didn't bring that. I go, what? Can you go get it? He goes, well, no, it's Saturday. It's in a safe deposit box. The bank's closed. And I'm like ripping my hair out. Later on in the day, something else came in. I did get on, but uh, you just, <laughs> but it's a fabulous show. What a way to see the country. I mean, why would I ever go to Boise, go to Omaha, go to uh, Fargo? And anywhere you go in this country, it's beautiful. And if you have any time at all, it's fabulous. And the people are nice. Don't talk about politics and religion, but uh, it, it's, it can be a lot of fun. And almost any type of collecting that you do, there are things to look for. There's something to learn. And one of the things that I love about this business and thing is that you never can know everything. And one of the great sources is, no, you don't know everything. If you did, it would get boring. But you know to go to libraries like the historical and genealogical, or you know colleagues, or you know the person to call. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know where that information is. And even with the advent of the internet, which has helped people tremendously get information. I have a daughter who lives in Africa. The fact that she and the people there can access all this information cheaply, quickly, and freely is fabulous for society. It's not maybe great for the thing for some of the books and the book collecting, but the other thing that comes up with the internet is it's totally unedited. It has great information, but it's you never know how accurate it is. You never know whether everything's there. Do you ever get past the first page? And that's where libraries, librarians, uh, if you're looking up your background, your history, your genealogy, there are good sites, but if you don't know how to use those sites properly, it's a tool. And I tell people, if it's a tool that you know how to use, it's great. On the other hand, like if someone is a great cabinet maker and they have their tools, they can make great cabinets. I can take their tools and bang my thumb with a hammer and all I get is a sore thumb. So use the resources that you have that people use and help them point you in the right direction. Now I can go on and on and on like this. Uh, matter of fact, one of the problems is that when people ask someone a question who loves what they're doing, it's not getting an answer. It's getting them to stop answering. But I'm willing to bet that Todd has some questions at this point, and there is a large audience. And why don't I do some of the question and answer and anything that you ask me, I can go off on a tangent anyways. Are there some, Todd? Do we, do we have some of the questions? Yeah, we or? definitely have some questions, um, Ken. So, <clears throat> The, um, the first question, it has a related um, question too. So kind of a two-part question. So Catherine asks, I recently inherited about six large boxes of books, mostly dated 1900 to 1920, with a few older. I don't know where to start with determining value or what to do with them since I can't keep them all and don't want to toss them. So I'm looking for strategies on what to do. And so we have another question that's related uh, and this person asked, to disperse a collection, would you recommend a dealer or an auction house? What are the pros and cons of each? Uh, well, both of those could be long. First, I'll start with the first part. One of the easiest ways nowadays with computers is line the books up on a shelf, take a digital picture of the shelf, make sure it's in focus. Let me <laughs> add that part. But if I can read the spines, Sometimes you can get two or three shelves in a, in a picture. Not only does it show me the condition, but I can tell what a lot of the books are. I know what they should look like. And that's much quicker and easier than making lists uh, and so on. So 
usually that's what we recommend people do on a first um, go through. Just take pictures, line them up. If you can't read a spine, then maybe open it up to the title page. But it very quickly can show us, gee, this really looks, especially on large collections, can uh, be very uh, important. And then usually, then I can ask questions from there. So that's usually what I recommend. I mean, people can always bring books in. They can always send lists. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Uh, a couple of things to look at too, when you get a collection that you either don't know the details of, the, if there's a lot of books on one subject. In other words, if you have 500 books on the history of New England or New England families, chances are whoever collected that collection made a real effort to get those books. So usually that's a better collection yeah. uh, as opposed to a book on this and a book on that. Uh, another thing to look for is, is the book printed around when the event was happening? Usually the closer to the event, the better. In other words, a book on the American Revolution written in the 1770s is usually better and more valuable than one printed in the 1970s. So is the timing. Another quick thing, and again, these are just quick. Usually the less the book is about, the better the book is. If you have a 200 page book and it covers all of world history, I will guarantee you it's not an in-depth study. If you have a 200 page book on the history of Gloucester, let's say, or some particular town, probably someone's put a lot of time and effort into that book and there's a lot of valuable information in it. Condition is very important. The paper dust jacket, the first edition, um, and there are some glaring examples. If you have a first edition of The Great Gatsby, a good first edition without a dust jacket is worth a few thousand dollars. I mean, it's a good book, valuable. The dust jacket on that is particularly beautiful, particularly fragile, and particularly rare. Get a first edition of The Great Gatsby with a perfect dust jacket in absolutely mint condition, and that few thousand dollars goes to maybe a hundred, 150,000. So that paper jacket can be worth a hundred. So condition, because part of collecting usually is prestige. Be able to say, I have the best, I have the most wonderful. Essentially, I have what you don't have and people who can afford it will pay absolute top price for the very, very best, but might not spend anything at all for something less. One other example on the first part of this is, Usually a book early in an author's career is more valuable and scarce than a later book. I mean, you know, when someone writes a first book, they're unknown, unheard of, usually a publisher, small amount. Uh, a huge example of that is Harry Potter. When that first came out, nobody expected it to sell. The first edition of the first English edition was relatively small, actually went to libraries, got read to pieces. A mint copy of the first edition of the first Harry Potter book in England recently sold for over $400,000. That even astounded me. Yeah. But it, it amazing prices. But the last one, the seventh book, first edition was probably 10 million copies. It's never going to be valuable. What was the second part? That was, that was the quick... Yeah. So the second part was, would you recommend uh, a dealer to disperse a collection or an auction house? I think what happens is I could stand on one side and, and give you great reasons why you should sell to a dealer, which I am. And I could stand on another side and tell you why you should uh, maybe go at auction with certain things. The reality is the more valuable your collection is, the more options you have. Uh, if you have books that are worth thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Of, there is no question. Everybody is going to bend over backwards, jump up and down, do whatever they can to get you the absolute top best price you can get. And in some cases, it might be a private sale. In some cases, it might be auction. <clears throat> it depends on what exactly the book is. On the other hand, we just recently in the New Haven area bought 20,000 art books in one house. I'll tell you, carrying art books from a third floor Victorian attic 
is brutal. It's a heavy, it's a lot of work in the job, but there was maybe a few books that were worth $500, maybe a few a thousand. No auctioneer would touch that library yeah. because it, there's too much work involved. Or if you just have a few books worth a few hundred dollars, the paperwork that goes into auctions you have to have higher amounts. So the really your options come with going up and up in value. And the way to start with that is, you know, again, the pictures, sending either some dealers, some auction galleries, the pictures you have, you'll find out pretty quickly, maybe even by how many responses you get, yeah. whether your things have potential or not. I, want, I will say one thing, we always answer. And one of the reasons we do that is we just never know, maybe if we're courteous to you, your neighbor has a great collection, but we always respond. Whereas sometimes you'll send out 10 emails and get one or two responses. That tells a lot. So another question, Michael asks, and this will be of interest to a lot of our members, what is the market for genealogical books? Genealogical books have, I hate to put it this way, have really lost a lot of value in the last 20 years. Um, I mean, one of the great bookstores in the country through the most of the 20th century was a bookstore called Goodspeeds in Boston. Oh, yeah. They had a whole department with three, four, five people just selling town history, genealogies, family histories. The problem really has come now that so much of that material now is online and digitized that people don't feel the need to have the book. So if you have the history of a town that has a lot of family information or the actual genealogy, if you're in that family or in that town, they make wonderful gifts and people will still pay a decent price. But where other people wanted those books so they could study their history, their family, all they wanted was the information they didn't want the book specifically, but they needed the information in a large library. So the number of people who want that book might have fell from a few hundred or 500 or 50 to maybe a tenth of that. Thus, books come down. The other thing is, before the internet, a lot of those books were really, really hard to get. You didn't know where to go. You didn't know what dealer. If you saw it on a bookshelf, if you didn't buy it then, you'd be afraid you'd never find it again for years. Now you go click, click, 10 copies might come up. Uh, and two things happen with that. First of all, there are 10 copies. So the price comes down just because they're available. Yeah. Second of all, you go, well, gee, if there are 10 or 20 copies, I don't need a whole library full of books. When I need it, I'll order it, which means in most cases, you never order it because you don't need it. But it also gives tremendous access to libraries like yours with a librarian or a curator telling you this is what you need this is what we can email the information uh i i know one librarian in wisconsin who used to work for us he worked for the historical society there and they started digitizing years ago and when the internet came in and he said you know the people coming into the library the number has dropped but the number of people using the library has gone up about 500%. So it's the information. And if you want a book just because you want the information, the price has gone down. I mean, it, it, who buys an encyclopedia? Who buys a dictionary? Uh, and it's even beyond that. I had a friend retiring recently. He says, I wanna take up tennis. Do you have any good books on tennis? We looked, there were a few. And then he said, you know, YouTube's better because you can actually see the." So if you just need information, the internet's wonderful. But so it, it, it's, it's really sort of moderated, although the ones that are truly rare, truly only a few copies, truly the best, they're still in demand and libraries still have to fill in places. So there is a market, but it's, it's a little less than it was. So Maureen asks a question that's kind of a follow-up to this. Um, she asks, what do you see as the future of the independent bookstore with the existence of big stores and Amazon and the continuation of COVID? Uh, well, let's just say I am, as far as the continuation of COVID, 
I'm just going to cringe at that question because I don't want it to continue, period. I, None of us do. I, I mean, we're all more than ready. I mean, matter of fact, in the store where I'm doing this, it's our rare book section. It's snowing out in Boston for those of you who aren't here, and it's a slow day. But I had to close this section to get the background because I can't wear a mask when and have other people here. So let's just say COVID's going to go away. It will, it will at some point and somehow. Uh, as far as the independent bookstore, the smaller bookstore, actually, they're making a comeback. I mean, stores like mine, like I say, in the inner cities, the hard part is not the desire that people want books. It's not that people don't like bookstores. It's just property value is, rent is, if I didn't own it, uh, I, I'm probably subsidizing it by having the building. Uh, but I love what I do and I'm gonna continue doing it. And, and, but a lot of the times though, uh, independent bookstores actually have been increasing because what's happened with a company like Amazon, which is even putting the big chains in danger yeah. is they're so big and so impersonal that if you can now open a small bookstore in a smaller town and then cater to your audience, have, uh, people signings know that oh this person is looking for books on this subject and be able to give them that service or know that the tourists who come in are looking for local items actually use the the independent bookstores are making a resurgence by giving personalized service by being unique by having people come in one of the things that happened with us and again I never planned this but without outside tables there in the outside bookstore when it's not raining or snowing yes. hundreds of people take pictures all day long because it's so unusual and then post them on the uh instagram or whatever we get huge amounts of pr for that so people still love books they still buy it and they like the unusual and they like the personal so i think there's a definite future there well, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm sure a lot of other people are glad to hear that. So Cheryl asks, what are, you, uh, what are some of your favorite books about books that you have enjoyed reading? Well, <laughs> there are a lot of them. There, this is a little harder to get, but I mentioned the company called Goodspeeds. They right. used to put out a monthly newsletter, a little pamphlet called The Month at Goodspeeds, which was some of the highlights of what they got in. But the man who wrote that was a great historian, loved the uh, items. And if you can ever get little, the little pamphlets, they were out for about 40 years. They're one of the best things I've ever read about books and book collecting. Uh, there's, a, there's an author that's a little out of date called A. Edward Newton that wrote books called The Pleasures of Book Collecting. There was a famous book dealer named Rosenbach. He wrote a, a book on books, but also too, there have been some mysteries. And, uh, and so sometimes on books, the fictionalized ones are good. And there was one that came out recently, uh, a couple of years ago called uh, Camino Island by John Grisham. Um, and it's about a theft of, from Princeton University of uh, Fitzgerald books. I, I, the book came out, and I started getting phone calls from friends and they go, have you seen this book yet? Uh, it's not really you, but uh, it turns out <laughs> that this fence, although the bookstore that was dealing with the stolen books was in Florida, they went through a fence in Boston and John Grisham somehow described to a T, he changed the name, but it was a bookstore, a three-story brick building on West Street in Boston. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going, who, why doesn't John Grisham like me? Uh, I ended up talking to him on the phone about it. Uh, he said he wasn't sure where he got the information. Uh, he said he'd take me out to dinner. I'm still waiting for dinner, but I got a signed copy saying I owe you a dinner. So that's one of my favorite books, but there were thousands of them and they're just fun. I, I enjoy reading books about books, book collecting. Uh, we have a whole section at the store and uh, so there isn't any one. There are technical books. There's a man named Cotter who writes books yeah. about the, the science of book collecting, the terminology of book collecting. That's almost an, an essential 
but mm -hmm. it's not something you read for fun necessarily. And if, if someone ever wanted to get in touch and actually talk about that, I could go on and enumerate much more than I am here. So Francis asks, have you ever purchased something valuable that turned out to be a fake? Boy, is that like, I, I could have told her. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the things that I say to people, whether they be collectors, because a lot of times when people start out as collectors, one of the things they're afraid of is that they'll pay too much, they'll get something that's not right, they'll uh, make a mistake. And, and everybody makes a mistake. I mean, I've had that happen. And you sort of go, ah, well, learn from it. Don't do that again. But when I talk to people and sometimes the book collector and they go or a dealer and say, I haven't made a mistake for the last 10 or 20 years. I say to myself quickly, that's the biggest mistake you've ever made. Because that means you've probably turned down or passed up by being too conservative make a mistake every once in a while, but chances are you're not gonna remember the mistake. You're gonna remember the one you didn't buy, the one that got, the big fish that got away that you're looking for for the next 30 years. So every once in a while, you take a chance, you make a mistake, you learn, you learn from that. You try to do the best you can, but it isn't. But there were some times when you're doing things, people get something in and they want it to be what they want it to be that no matter what you say or do, they believe that it is. And that's something that collectors do themselves. They, wait, I need, and they almost convince yourself, even when you're an experienced professional, right. that this is what it is. And then you realize you should. My wife one time was doing a few years, she appraised the Antiques Roadshow. And when people come to Antiques Roadshow, a lot of times, other than under COVID, they're waiting in line for a few hours. And as appraisers, you have to realize that because sometimes you can look at the line and you go, junk, 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 you know, that's not worth anything. And But you have to, people have been waiting, they've come, they've gotten tickets, they bring things up. You wanna be able to look at it, hold it, touch it, give them time. Lady comes in, she has a book. She goes, I have a book signed by A. Lincoln and my wife, very nicely looks at it, looks at the signature, looks at the book and says, it is signed by A. Lincoln, but just not the A. Lincoln we both want it to be. <laughs> and the lady goes, well, how can you tell? And my wife says, well, the first clue, and she turns to the title pages, this book was printed in 1915. And the lady goes, so? And my wife goes, well, when I was in school, I." learned that Abraham Lincoln been, had, was assassinated in 1865. Lady slams the book shut and goes, you don't know what you're talking about and leaves. Now that's an extreme, but you can convince yourself it does happen. Uh, and again, one of the things that you do is you have the resources to get in touch with people. Someone will call me and if I'm not sure, I have a friend who specializes in in autographs and manuscripts. I'll maybe call them up and say, John, what do you think of this? Or look, there's a big collection. These are right in your field. Why don't we work together on it? So again, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know who to call and work with and have build that up over the years and do it in such a way that people wanna work with you. So that's sort of a partial answer. So, um, so Mary Jean asks a question that's kind of, uh, follows up on this. Um, she says, I have a 1736 Biblia, German, I think. The only words on the title page I can read is D. Martin Luther. So she's asking, is this valuable? And I would follow up with, so how can she do some research to try to find out more about this? You say you don't need to know everything. You just need to know who to ask. So, so what should someone like Mary Jean do in that situation? Well, a, a couple of things that come to mind uh, immediately on that. First of all, take some pictures. You could uh, email them to libraries. That's, you know, a Lutheran college, uh, libraries that have big collections of Lutheran say, what do you think? Uh, you could send them to an auction gallery or a bookstore like mine. And usually we can point you in the right direction 
or we can give you information. Now, initially, what you said to me was, you have a Lutheran Bible in German in the 1700s. The first thing that comes to my mind is Luther wrote in the 1500s. So you're talking about 200 years after Luther had died. It was, it's a major religion. There are tons and tons of Lutheran Bibles. It's worth checking because there's always the exception. Chances are, if it's a family Bible, it probably has more sentimental value than monetary value. But there were some big fancy ones. It's worth checking. But if you had said in the 1540s and Luther had, then that would be picking up right away. So that would be my first thing. But pictures, going to authorities, most people, if you ask them nicely, are more than happy to share their knowledge. They want to talk about what they know. And usually they will help. And if that person doesn't help, ask someone else. So um, another question, Siobhan says, in 2022, I plan to start a children's book collection. Any thoughts on where to begin? And what should I buy from you today? Oh, my most expensive book. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, first of all, children's book collection is such a huge area. I mean, there, the Newbury Library in Chicago has tens of thousands of children's books. Uh, you probably want to first think of what children's book do you like? What books, what area, period? Do you like newer ones? Do you like the Harry Potters? Do you like uh, the, the Pooh books, the Oz books? Do you like Kate Greenaway? Do you like N.C. Wyatt? Do you like the illustrators? Do you, uh, Narnia, I mean, Tolkien even, the so first of all, I would say you, you want to narrow it down a little. And one of the ways you can do that is by going to bookstores, see people who have collections in their store of children's books and sit down and talk with them. Go to libraries, go to the children's library, uh, especially if it's a library, one of the larger ones that has rarer children's books and talk to the librarian, get some ideas. And it can go, a collection like that can either go from a particular author, a particular story, a particular period, a particular illustrated, or it can be one book. I know people who collect one book, Alice in Wonderland. They have thousands of Alice in Wonderlands. That's their children's collection. Uh, other people might be interested in, like I say, boys' uh, mysteries, children's, Nancy Drew, mysteries. So the first thing I would do is try to narrow it down. And if you have trouble doing that, go to bookstores, go to libraries, go to, there are, they'll hopefully be starting soon, a lot of book shows and fairs, and talk to the dealers who specialize in the area. And I can point you in the right direction too, if you wanted to call and check, but it's narrowing it down because you can't collect everything, but collect what you like and enjoy and can afford. That's two things. Make sure you collect something that you really enjoy and you really want to go out because the search and the hunt and the other people you meet are the fun. And you probably should make sure that ultimately you can afford it because there's always something in every price range. Well, that um, you know, kind of relates to another question um, that was asked. I'm always curious to hear the book dealer's perspectives on collecting since dealers work with so many collectors, what advice do you have for people of modest means who are starting to collect more seriously? Um, well, uh, it, there's, there's things that you can collect in, that aren't necessarily all that expensive. Just go around, look, see what catches your eye. I'll, I'll mention one thing that I, uh, uh, one collection, although I don't collect books, I do collect stories. There is one collection that I started and it started off as a bit of a joke. Uh, I one time went and there was a book called, uh, I got a book in and it was, had a picture of the toil a toilet on the cover. And the title of the book was Flushed with Pride, the story of Thomas Crapper. There, there it is. But what I liked about it was the illustration of the cover illustration. And it was sort of funny. I brought it home. I showed it to my wife. She took one look at it and said, we have to put that in the bathroom. Next week or so, I got another book and had a big eye staring out of the cover. 
title was We Never Sleep. It was the history of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. But with a big eye staring at you, I thought, ah, put that in the bathroom too. Now, this is a little half bathroom, has no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves. And now we have about 400 of these Victorian style illustrated books in our bathroom. And one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be really valuable is every once in a while a book falls off the shelf and you can imagine where it ends up. Uh, and, and also, uh, so there, there's, there's an area where you can pick up individual books. Individually, they don't seem like that much. But, and you can go to yard sales, book sales, auctions, whatever, and pick them up too. But individually, but graphically as a collection, they're a lot of fun. So there's, there's a way that you can collect. And, this, and for every subject area that you can possibly think of, there are lower price ephemeral things, or there was a lady who collected art books, but she had an interest because art books, you can spend millions. She collected children's instructional art books, only children's instructional art books. Going back into the 17, 1800s, it was an amazing collection and nobody else was collecting them. So therefore you have less competition and the price was lower. Yeah, I could see where that, uh, that would make sense to really specialize in something. And then she actually ended up selling the whole collection years later to a library who thought this is a great in institutional collection. So there you go. So we've also had a lot of um, questions that kind of relate um, to um, fixing up your books, having them conserved or repair. Um, you know, do you have advice on that? Does it potentially make a valuable book better in terms of resale? And I'd love to hear your interest as a conservator, uh, you know, what you have to say about that subject as well. In general, people who collect books want it as close to the original, as in perfect collection as, as it can be. Uh, I mean, if you have a book that's in absolute perfect condition, don't do anything to it. If you want to protect it, maybe go to a book binder, get a box made that can be very simple or very beautiful. The book is in the box, the box is on the shelf, it protects it. But if you've got something that needs, you know, fixing or repair, there are two ways to look at it. One is financial. If you have a $5 book and you put a $200 repair in a $5 book, when you're done, you're gonna have a repaired $5 book. Now, financially, that makes no sense. Now, if you have a $5,000 book and you put a repair in it and it's a few hundred dollars and it makes it look better, more usable, more workable, yeah, that might make a lot of sense. The other way to look at that is if the book has sentimental value, then the cost of repair, if it's been handed down generation to generation to generation, then the cost of the repair isn't done through a financial looking at it. it's It's, you know, what you want. Also, for the average person, not the library at historic, where you have to preserve things for generations or some of the other great libraries, people aren't gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on alarm systems, it's just, uh, fire suppression systems, alarms, and all that. Generally, I say, if you're comfortable, the book will be comfortable. If it's not too hot, too cold, too damp, too dry, these books have lasted a, a lot longer than we have and probably will last a whole lot longer. As long as you don't do something to hurt the book, you probably don't want them in direct sunlight. A lot of times you'll see bindings that are brown on the, uh, on the spine and then blue or green. They didn't make them too toned, they just faded. Also, you don't want them too tight because somebody will inevitably pull them off the shelf and pull the top. You don't want them too loose because they'll bend a little. But generally, if you treat them well, that's probably the most reasonable thing. Now, I do have people who collect modern books, uh, like an author that they're collecting the first edition. They want the perfect copy. What they do is a lot of times they buy two copies they buy one copy, they put it in acetate wrapper, they put it in the glass case, they close the glass case, and then they read the other one. So that's another way of keeping it uh, well-preserved. But it, 
it depends on how much your books are worth. If you're talking the average person, the average book, just don't abuse them. If you're talking things worth tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably you've thought about this more any case. So um, speaking of books that are worth tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, we've gotten a lot of questions um, that people have asked basically, what's kind of the most valuable book that you've found or what's your favorite book that you've ever found? Well, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of quick things since we're running towards the, the hour. Uh, and then I'll end with one story about Bibles. Uh, I've handled some things either because of appraisal or, uh, or owning that have just been amazing. Uh, I got a call from another institution in the Boston area. There are others. Uh, and they were <laughs> loaning a, a document uh, to, an, to another museum and they just needed an appraisal. And I, I'm a member. I said, look, I'll do the appraisal for free, but... I want to see the item. I don't want to do it from your website. I don't want to copy. I want to see the item. Four page handwritten account of Paul Revere's ride by Paul Revere. I mean, I'm sitting there holding and touching. The fact that that even exists is amazing. Another time I got called. Now, again, I was a chemistry major. I got called to a, a university just outside of Boston to do an appraisal. They had a copy of Newton's Principia Mathematica, a first edition. Now, a good copy of Principia Mathematica, first edition, is worth upwards of a million dollars. This was Isaac Newton's copy that he wrote marginal notes in the, the text. I'm holding Isaac Newton's copy. The book now is at the Huntington Library in Pasadena. Before the pandemic, I was in Pasadena. <laughs> I went to the library, I looked at the case, and I go, I touched that book. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we one time had a first edition of The Great Gatsby in terrible shape, inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald, then Eliot annotated the whole thing. But I deal with these type of things. Most of it is general books, day to day, outside at a dollar three, but you get to touch these. <clears throat> but I got asked once, what's the most, to you, the most valuable book? that you have or, or have held. And I heard another book dealer answer this. And I said, look, can I steal your answer? Because it really meant something to me. There is a copy of The Night Before Christmas. Uh, it's a nicely illustrated copy, you know, probably mid 20th century. That copy I have read, my daughters are in their thirties now. I have read to my daughters every Christmas Eve since when they're born and they're in their 30s and still now to even the grandchildren. And it got to the point where one of my daughters lives in Africa. So FaceTime. Another daughter, her husband's from Texas. And just before FaceTime, she had one time gone to Texas for Christmas. I did it on YouTube and sent her the link. That copy of The Night Before Christmas means more to me and my family and is more valuable than all of the other books that you can think of because of the sentiment. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, I'll always see more high price things. I'll never be able to replace that. I'm gonna end, we're, we're running out of time. And again, anybody, uh, if you like my stories, I do a podcast called Brattlecast. Uh, I have a hundred something episodes out. I put a new one out every two weeks. So if you like the stories, there's lots of them, uh, but um, we, we, I also, when you ask somebody again about questions and I love getting them, uh, I'll always try to answer. We always answer emails within two business days. I emphasize that because if you don't get an answer that quickly, it means we didn't get your email. But the most commonly printed book of all time always has been, probably always will be is the Bible. And I sometimes get five and 10 calls a week, like the German Bible, with people calling 100, 200, 300 year old Bibles. And in most cases, we have to say to them, sentimentally, it's priceless. Monetarily, not so much. Now, there are exceptions. There's a Gutenberg Bible that's worth hundreds, probably in the millions. hundreds of millions. There are other Bibles, so it's always worth checking. Uh, 
but I got a call to a large old church in Boston. Um, they had a huge library that they had just accumulated. It was well over a hundred year old church. They, they wanted me to look at the books to just see if there was anything valuable. I spent a day at the, at the church and their library. They had some nice things, it was fun. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down the basement? There was a few more books. I went down the basement, looked at a few more. Again, a few nice things. But then there was a closet, actually more like a small room off from the corner of the basement. And the priest opened the door, front to back, floor to ceiling, top to bottom. It was stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest and I go, what is this? And he goes, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible? They come and they present it to the church. And he goes, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, put it in with the rest of them. And he goes, we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. So I use it as an example to say that if you want to give something to a charity, ask them if they want it first. If they want it and can use it, it's great. But if all you're doing is taking your old stuff and you're not doing anybody a favor. Like I say, I can go on and on and on. If you have more questions, get in touch. I'll be happy to answer them. If you're in the Boston area, stop in. And maybe someday we can do one of these again, but do it live and hybrid. And uh, it, uh, thank you very much for having me. Well. Thank you so much, Ken. This has been uh, it, it really amazing. One of the people has commented in the chat that you are a jewel. Um, and I think <laughs> it's, it's very true, very accurate. Now, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, but if you have any other questions, um, you can contact us at uh, heritagetours at nehgs.org. And if you have questions for Ken, or you want to hear more stories from the rare book world, be sure to check out his podcast at brattlebookshop.com forward slash brattlecast. Brattlebookshop.com forward slash brattlecast. And I also wanted to uh, let you know about a few upcoming online programs that we'll be having. On January 20th, we'll be holding our fourth annual D. Camillo Rendezvous, featuring my colleague, Kurt D. Camillo, curator of special collections uh, at American Ancestors. Kurt will be presenting an illustration-rich lecture exploring Britain's royal collection, a collection formed over centuries by British kings and queens. So be sure to check us out online for that. And then on January 22nd, our archival and conservation experts, including myself, will be leading a virtual preservation roadshow. In addition to learning how best to organize and care for your documents, found volumes, and photographs, participants will be able to submit an image of an item from their personal collection and receive expert advice on how to best preserve that item. You can learn more about these and all of our upcoming programs at American Ancestors dot org forward slash events. And thank you very much, Ken, for all your stories about the rare book world. And thank all of you for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us some feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and much appreciated. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you online in the future. Goodbye for now.